Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. In September of 1981, I lived with my father on a farm in western Wisconsin. There had been some buzz within the community of an unknown, large, hairy creature spotted by deer hunters not far from our farm. This is that story. One evening, my father and I were coming home from the store and noticed what appeared to be two hairy creatures collecting squash from the garden. Each creature was at least six feet tall. It was dusk, but there was enough light to see clearly what they were doing. My father immediately cut the headlights and brought the car to a stop. We watched them pick and eat the squash as if they didn't have a concern in the world. They didn't seem to notice us, even though we were about a hundred feet from them. Then, after five minutes, one of the creatures looked in our direction and stared. Its eyes glowed red from the moonlight. Seeing this filled us with fear. We stopped the car and sped off toward home. As we made the turn into the driveway, a huge disc-shaped object about 40 feet in diameter appeared above us and slowly moved toward the east field about 200 yards away, and landed. A large sliding door opened, and a foggy green light glowed from within the craft. After a few seconds, the door closed, and the craft slowly rose and shot up toward the north. We were in shock. I didn't know what to think. After getting over what we'd just seen, it was then we noticed that the creatures were gone. A few days later, our neighbor from down the road came over for dinner. After we finished eating, my father and Mr. Kane walked outside to talk. An hour later, they left. As I was cleaning up, my father told me Mr. Kane and his sister had witnessed one of the craft on the same night. They also witnessed several of the large, hairy creatures meandering in the nearby woods. Mr. Kane said, that he knew something had been in the woods for several weeks, but never got a good look until the craft arrived. After that night, we never had another encounter, nor did we hear of more sightings by any people in the area. Do you think that these creatures were Bigfoot, aliens, or one and the same? It always seems strange to me that a Bigfoot body has never been found. Is it a possibility that Bigfoot is an extraterrestrial being? On to the next one. I was born and raised in Paradise, California, and it seemed like the ideal place at the time. Small town with great people who are quiet and, most importantly, peaceful. So, when I moved to Los Angeles for work, it was a huge change for me. The hustle and bustle of one of the biggest cities in America was way too much for me. Although I made good money, the juxtaposition between the money in my pocket and the quality of life was just not enough for me. Combine that with the overall state of Los Angeles, crime, poverty, Drug addicts on every corner, it was just too much. One evening, I was leaving work and getting to the parking garage downtown. There had been problems with hoodlums breaking windows and stealing things out of glove boxes and trunks, but you never think that kind of stuff will happen to you, right? It was one of those sloped parking lots, and the way I parked meant that when I exited the elevator, I had to walk up the ramp to my vehicle. For a split second, I thought I saw a head peek out from behind the bed of a truck, but I wasn't sure, so I kept walking. 
the next thing I knew, I had a gun stuck in my face and I was being robbed. What made the situation worse was that when I looked to my left, down on the lower ramp, there's a security guard and he was watching me being robbed. And he looks and keeps walking. This experience was the last straw for me. I was done with LA. So I went inside and told my boss that I'd been robbed and that I quit. In my mind, I, I jumped on top of his desk, slammed my briefcase, kicked over his coffee, and gave him the middle finger. However, the reality of the situation was much less exciting. My boss offered to let me work from home if I spent 260 hours in the office per year. I agreed, and within a week, I packed up, found a house to rent, and left. Life is going well for me now, with no traffic or hustle and bustle. I wake up early in the morning, go hiking in the woods, then return by 7 a.m., eat breakfast, and work in my home office. I feel great. I'm getting in better shape, and feeling like a million bucks. I've even gone on a few dates. Yes, life is looking up for me. Then it all started to go downhill real fast when one morning I was out for my hike and all of a sudden things just changed. The air felt heavier and my senses were heightened. Part of me wanted to run while another part wanted to lie down, curl up into a small ball, and cry. I found myself frozen in place for no apparent reason, then started scanning the woods and saw it. A massive, nine-foot-tall Bigfoot. Now, pause right here in the story and listen. I had no interest in Bigfoot and didn't believe in it, but what I saw was real. A giant, hairy man with shoulders the size of the front of a Honda Civic. It had reddish black fur and was standing next to a tree, staring at me before turning and walking deeper into the woods, leaving me standing there, wondering, thinking, and fearing for my life. I couldn't tell you how long it was before I regained my wits and started to walk back to the house, but I remember walking and just seeing it over and over again in my head. I needed to figure it out. So I spent the rest of the day researching tall, hairy men and Bigfoot in Paradise, California, which turned out to have a lot of sightings. The year was 2017, and the events that followed were like something from a horror movie. And I say that because the events that followed were insane, and I'm not sure what to make of it all. Had I done something to bring it all on myself? Was I cursed? Or... Was life just happening as it does? Whatever it was, the next 12 months were a living hell, because at night, I would see this thing standing outside in the woods right at the edge of the tree line with these glowing green eyes. And by glow, I don't mean self-illumination. I mean its eyes reflected green light from the house's floodlight. It would be there four nights a week, just hanging out and watching me. It got to the point where I was scared to go outside at night. I stopped hiking altogether and just stayed in the house. This went on for months, and then the dead stuff started showing up in the yard. Dead rabbits, dead cats with their heads crushed, just tossed in the backyard. Freaky stuff that scared the life out of me. And by that, I mean you get so scared you stop experiencing the good things in life. The rest and relaxation were gone. My peace was gone. I felt the same way I did when I lived in LA, except this was not the big city. Nonetheless, I still felt like there was this constant threat, like anything could happen to me at any moment. Then the fire started, a raging fire unlike anything anyone had ever seen. By then, I was a full-blown insomniac, scared to sleep, and before the fire was on the news, before the sirens, before anything, I saw this light beam coming from the sky. How did I see it? I was in the window looking at him, and it was 5.40 a.m. He looked up at the sky and took off running. The sky was filled with smoke, 
and when I went outside, I realized it was a massive fire. So I woke my neighbors, grabbed what I could, and evacuated. The news showed the worst of it all. However, my place didn't burn to the ground, but the smoke destroyed everything. And I mean everything. Sometimes I wonder if the Bigfoot knew that was going to happen, and that was his way of helping me. And other times, it just felt like he was stalking me. Either way, I'm alive, and I wanted to tell my story. On to the next one. In St. Clair County, Michigan, near Michigan Highway 21 and Redibule Road, two friends and I were out in the state forest in October for deer hunting season. We were camping out on a ridge about one mile from the junction of the two roads. It was dark, and we were sitting around our fire talking. We all heard someone walking the low side of the ridge along the north side by the Pine River, about 40 to 50 yards distance. It was heavy and methodical in its movement. It didn't really waver and never tripped over all the branches, brush, and undergrowth along the stream. It circled to the east, then we heard a piercing scream. We all froze and began to regain our thoughts. We decided it was someone trying to scare us. During this time, the creature in question moved to the south slope of the ridge and was no more than 20 yards distant. We had no view of anything, as, having all just rose from the fire, we couldn't see too far into the wood. Dan yelled out that we all had weapons and the joke was up, but if the individual didn't show themselves, we would shoot in its direction. The next day, we heard a loud, high-pitched scream and a tree falling. We all retreated to the fireside again, and, as we did, something very large passed just beyond the firelight and was running faster than us with long strides. We could hear the footfalls, and it tore through the forest, knocking down small saplings and dead branches as it went. If you know how in the woods at night sounds travel, just imagine our surprise when we judged its speed by the length of time it took to surround to fade to nothing. It was no more than 15 to 20 seconds. After a short time, we got our nerve up again and took flashlight to where the sound of the tree falling came from. To our surprise, we found a tree about six to eight inches in diameter snapped like a toothpick, about eight and a half feet up. We returned to camp and decided to stay by the fire and leave at daybreak for the road, even though only half a mile or slightly more. It was dark. We couldn't see too well, and whatever it was could see real well. The night, as the fire died several times, we could make out a large outlying shadow about 10 to 15 yards beyond the good light watching us. At one point, it approached a few steps, and when we all moved to reach for weapons, it retreated into the darkness and reappeared off to the side. This went on all night. The next day, we left, and the next night discussed it with Dan's father, who informed us something had been watching him while he sat in his tree stand and he heard strange squeals and hoots in the distant valley. A week later, we again returned to our camp. This time, the thing only circled us. We experienced this throughout the deer season, and once we were able to see something crouched over in a squatting position, watching us as we watched it. We could get only the outline and tell it had dark black like hair or fur. It used its hand as we do to steady itself, and its eyes glowed yellowish in the light, not green or red, like so many wild animals do. This continued for about two to three months, and then it stopped. I haven't been out there in several years, but if Sasquatch wanted a place to live in the area of Michigan, Beards Hill is ideal. It has hills, ridges, swamps, water, and many things and places to stay deep enough to not be found. The area is forested from Yale area all the way to Lexington, Michigan. We told only close friends for fear of being thought of as a bunch of young liars. We were only 18, 19, and 20 at the time. This is an environment of thick forest and oak ridges with swamps, valleys, and bogs. It's really a strange area for this section of Michigan. It is more like the foothills out west, 
or the really thick forests of Ontario north of Lake Superior. On to the next one. This happened in Michigan. I was nine years old at the time. My grandfather owns a large amount of land in Glenny, off Dakota County. It is a wooded terrain with some areas swampy. My grandfather bought it a long time ago when he was very young and an acre was very inexpensive. My family goes up there to hunt and relax in the forest. There are many trails and we always take our three-wheelers. I remember one day we went out on the trails to ride around and my dad's cousin got stuck somehow and I was riding on the back of our three-wheeler with my mom driving. I remember looking to my left and seeing this very tall creature. It was probably seven feet tall and was very hairy all over, like stringy hair, and I did not see its face, just the back of it walking very sloth-like into the forest. No one else saw this, unfortunately. At the time of the occurrence, the rest of the group was engrossed in the attempt to free my dad's cousin's three-wheeler that was stuck. I remember being so terrified that I just buried my face into my mom's back and holding on for dear life. When I did tell my mom and dad about what I saw, of course, they laughed at me and said I was just a kid. I will never forget what I saw. The image is forever burned in my memory. The animal was very tall and had long arms, almost sloth-like. Its entire body was covered in long, stringy hair. I did not see its face. The moment I saw the creature, it was turning and walking back into the forest. I've told my husband, and he says he believes me, but my parents tell me not to tell the story to friends because they don't want people to think I'm crazy. I know now that I'm not. I've told friends and family members. Some believe me, and some don't. On to the next one. Mimicry is a commonly employed tool in the animal kingdom for a host of reasons, including communication, self-defense, and predation. These imitations need not be sophisticated. The Australian shingleback lizard, for example, has a flat tail which looks strikingly like its head to confuse predators. On the other end of the spectrum, ocean-dwelling cephalopods are among the most complex mimics on the planet, changing not only their skin's color, but also its textures to appear as both inanimate and animate objects. The mimic octopus, for instance, has been recorded changing its body shape to resemble lionfish, flatfish, sole, jellyfish, and sea snakes. Despite the obvious example of parrots, few animals mimic human speech. Apes, though so prone to physical imitation, their name is synonymous with mimicry, are congenitively capable of understanding human language, but widely believed incapable of reproducing it verbally due to physical imitation. Even when apes successfully echo human vocal cadences as a 50-year-old orangutan was taught in 2015, the results are not particularly compelling. If eyewitness testimony is to be believed, however, the world's greatest living mimic is indeed a primate. Countless accounts describing Bigfoot imitating a staggering amount of noises from other animals to mechanical sounds, even human speech. Hairy cryptids display uncanny imitation facilities in cultures around the world. According to the legend, the Ibugogo, short, hairy bipeds allegedly living on the Indonesian island of Flores, had their own fairly complex language and could even mimic an eerie degree the word of the Nage people, according to author Nick Redfern. The much larger Lehoa also lives on the island and boasts the same ability. Far away in Russia, the Yagmort shares many abilities with Bigfoot, including a love of swimming and a fondness for horses, and peculiar vocalizations, including the mimicry of human voices. Testimony from the modern era confirms these legends. Yang Wan Chun claimed to observe a wild man in 1977 in Shangxi Province, China, that uttered 11 or 12 different sounds which seemed 
to imitate a sparrow chirping, dog barking, pony neighing, leopard growling, and an infant crying. In another instant, from 1948, a Bigfoot raiding towns in Tabasco, Mexico, wrecked havoc among hunters, seeking to kill the beast, allegedly imitating other party members and drawing them to their doom. Despite how impressive and consistent these similarities are, they pale in comparison to the abilities reported by North American Bigfoot witnesses and First Nation tribes. Elder Otis Frank spoke of the Northern Cheyenne spirit beings of the mountain. They are a wild people who keep to the old ways that we had before time was noticed. They whistle to communicate. Sometimes they growl like the bear. Sometimes they imitate the coyote, the blue jay, and wild dog. But we know each of them by their voice. Stan Courtney, a researcher with a special interest in vocalization, has claimed to hear a variety of animal sounds during investigations. Owls, dogs, turkeys, raccoons, coyotes, and more. Stan states, I myself have heard in central Illinois, in the daytime, during the winter, what can only be described as jungle bird type sounds. Although none of these sounds were visually confirmed as coming from a Sasquatch, he adds, most occurred in areas that had previous eyewitness Bigfoot sightings, and each call was unnatural in its own way. Sometimes they imitate other animals, but not very well. New Mexican researcher Brendan Harris told Navajo Times, this not quite right quality is often what leads witnesses to assume these sounds originate from Bigfoot. Bird sounds too large and too loud. Owl hoot at unlikely times. Human voices in the woods as if they are coming from someone with a speech impediment speaking a foreign language. One Michigan witness described the voices on their property as sounding like an Amish deaf person. Bigfoot researchers propose a variety of reasons. The creatures display this ability. Some suggest they utilize mimicry to draw in and ambush prey, or the calls represent covert communication between individuals, a technique utilized by military, special forces, and criminals alike. Contact calls consist almost exclusively of animal imitations, especially of those animals that make noises at night wrote 19th century Austrian criminologist Hans Gross. Of course, people committing a robbery in the woods or approaching a home for a burglary don't call to each other by name or make any noise that would attract attention. An animal call, especially when well imitated, is never suspected. And when the criminals agree in advance who will make which animal noise, the calls are as clearly understood as the names themselves. Mimicry is not restricted to vocalization. Hairy hominids are also reported to imitate human beings' actions from pacing witnesses out of their habitat to attempting to build fires as in Guatemalan Thesmite folklore. In June 1999, Colette Alexander and her roommate were picnicking along California's San Lorenzo River when they spotted something peering at them from a large cypress brush 20 to 30 yards downriver. It appeared to be a strange cross between a human and an ape, and was mimicking Alexander as she ate her sandwich. When she slowed her movement, the Sasquatch responded in kind. It did exactly what Colette did, wrote researcher David Pallades. The creature even smirked at her as though it was having fun. It's a fool's errand to attempt a comprehensive catalog of noises imitated by Bigfoot, but here are some examples and ideas of the scope of the creature's ability. Deer. According to Christopher Noel, a Texas habuator once heard a white-tailed deer bark from 15 feet up a tree shortly before getting hit with an infrasound causing a panic attack. Some theorize this tactic is used to ambush prey. Sasquatch attract deer with these vocalizations before incapacitating them with infrasound. Cougars. Because both Bigfoot and large predatory cats are known for screaming, conflict naturally arises between the two. However, in the 1970s, campers near Wrangell, Alaska heard three loud screams along the Stekine River. Though likened to cougar vocalization, 
Witness Harvey Gross said, We did not think it was a cougar scream. It was far too loud. Farm Animal People at a Michigan farm shared audio with investigators from the BFRO in 2012. Immediately on hearing the first few moments of audio, I was impressed with what seemed to be out there, wrote investigator Jim Sherman. I heard what appeared to be communication between multiple vocalizers, mimicry of farm animals, and even interactions between humans and whatever it was in the woods. In another incident, Larry Johnson, a colleague of Ron Moorhead, described hearing what he thought was a herd of horses coming down the ridge. He did not know what to think about that. In May 2015, a witness in Skidaway Island State Park, Georgia, noticed grunts, detected foul smells, and heard a noise that sounded like a person with a very deep and raspy voice was trying to imitate a cow. It went moo, moo, twice, and then everything went quiet. We thought this was strange because the closest cows were five miles away and this sounded like a creepy imitation of a cow. Another Bigfoot tried to mimic a donkey in front of a Missouri witness, and some have reported sound of goats in areas of heavy Sasquatch activity. Frogs. In 1989, a pair of witnesses outside Nevada City, California, were sitting beside a lake when they noticed a loud bullfrog call from the reed. One of them approached the source of the sound, but were surprised to see a large, hairy creature stand up, run to the beach, and disappear into the woods. Rabbit, a witness near Ohio's Wayne National Forest, noted a variety of strange activity on their property, including agitated dogs. One October night, I started hearing what I thought was the worst imitation of a wounded or caught rabbit I'd ever heard. I almost laughed. This was followed by a long, protractorated howl. The following New Year's Eve, the witness clearly saw a tall, hairy figure in the yard. On to the next one. I had a strange experience while walking along the big river in Mendocino County near the Pacific Ocean south of the town of Mendocino in December 2019. It was one of those typical quiet mornings along the coast where there is a high fog, cloud layer, and no wind whatsoever. We were staying at the Little River Inn on the coast on Highway 1. What a beautiful place to stay. My girl and I loved to hike, and we were told that there was a great hike along the big river just a few miles north of the resort. So, we headed north a couple of miles and parked in the parking lot near the trailhead. It was around 9 a.m. and a typical coastal morning with the high marine layer of fog and clouds and mild temperature and absolutely no wind. We walked for about a mile or so and my girl said, What is that noise? Between the crunching of the gravel and our conversation, I hadn't heard anything out of the ordinary. My girl said the sound had come down from the embankment towards the river below us. She has a problem with height, and she did not want to go to the edge of the road to see what was making the sound she had heard. My hearing is not the best, but I went to the edge of the road to look down toward the big river to see what she had heard. Below my position of view, I could see a heavily leafed tree approximately 20 feet tall, about 15 feet below me, and 25 feet away, situated between a large rock outcropping and a large fir tree being shaken violently from side to side. The movement was rather fluid. I could not see anyone or anything causing this movement. As I said, there was not any wind, and the river that I could see was like a mirror without any ripples. I had a very strange feeling, and I could not comprehend what I was seeing. After a few seconds, I turned to my girl and we started walking again as I explained to her what I had seen. We walked about 25 feet further, and we both stopped and looked at each other. It was weird, but we both agreed to turn back as it didn't make any sense to keep going, knowing 
that whatever caused the tree to shake was behind us and between our car. It was like we instantly knew it was time to go back and not keep going on the road. We turned back and headed for our car. We never saw anything that could have caused the tree shaking. I had my iPhone and could have recorded the tree movement, but the sight of the tree moving swiftly from side to side was so unreal. I was very confused and did not even think about my ability to record the event. I can still see the 20-foot-tall tree being shaken side to side as if it were happening now. I don't know what caused this tree to shake like it did, but there was absolutely no wind of any kind. I can't imagine the strength it would have taken to make that tree move the way it did. The surrounding area is heavily wooded with steep, tree-lined slopes away from the river. Thanks for listening. I'm a Bigfoot believer, and I believe that I encountered a Bigfoot that day. Just wish I could have seen it. Actually, I'm glad I didn't. Peeing my pants would not have been a good experience either. On to the next one. Have you ever seen a big San Rafael swell tank? That's what they call potholes out there, because they're so huge, they're more like big tanks. What and where's the San Rafael swell? It's a place in central Utah that will blow your mind. My husband Cal and I have spent a lot of time out there because it's such a fascinating wild country. We used to take our black lab Zadie with us until she got too old to go. But let me tell you about a time when Zadie had the adventure of her life. I think we did too. It was about 10 years ago when we were all younger and not wiser and did some pretty interesting things. Seems we've slowed down a bit since then. Okay, we've slowed down a lot since then. Cal and I had planned this trip for months. It was our spring vacation. We get two weeks off in the spring during spring break at our school, one of the nice benefits of being teachers. We would always go out to Utah and hike and camp, and it was usually a great time to be out there, as the weather was typically mild then. We were in great shape, and when we had gotten into canyoning, which is more than just exploring canyons, it involves getting in and out, hopefully, of canyons, you can't just hike through, but have to repel, hike, climb, and sometimes even swim. It can be really grueling and a bit scary at times, but really isn't life-threatening unless you screw up. People do screw up, though. Like the guy who was hiking one easy canyon and took a wrong turn and ended up dead. He slipped down a pour-over, thinking he could keep going, and below him was another, bigger one he couldn't get down. At that point, he couldn't get up either. That was a sad story for sure. We're pretty thorough on our route finding, but this one time, we really screwed up. In spite of having studied Google Earth, topography maps, and reading a local guidebook, what we found wasn't in any guidebook. Some of the canyons of the swell are really just too narrow, you can't even get through them. They either squeeze down too much or the rappels are too high, but most of them are just fun challenges if you know what you're doing and are in good shape. Oh, and if it isn't raining up higher and you don't have flash flood, those are the real killers. And like they say, there's no substitute for feet on the ground, so sometimes all your research isn't the same as being there, and you find that things aren't what they seem. That's what happened to us. The canyons of the swells all erode down from about 7,000 feet where the swell tops out to about 4,000 where the San Rafael Desert meets them and they turn into washes eventually working their way through the flatter desert to the Colorado River. I've been on those lower washes, and they're usually wide and low-banked, and you would never guess 
what wild places the water in them has been. When they have water, that is, they're usually completely dry until a good rain pushes down from the upper swell and then it all comes at once. There's one wash out there north of the San Rafael River that's wider in places than a small river, but it's bone dry. You can see debris a good 100 feet up on either side of its bank. That wide wash was carrying a lot of water to overflow its bank that much. So you can imagine what those plot canyons in the swell can be like in a rainstorm. You don't want to find out, that's for sure. Cal and Zadie and I got out there in late spring, and you can tell it had rained not too long before because there was already some standing water in the small potholes where we parked our car by the head of the canyon. That meant we might be swimming. That water can be icy cold in the spring. You can get hypothermia real quick in some of those big tanks if you stay in too long. We had pretty good sized packs with plenty of water as you really don't want to drink the swell water as it carries a lot of selenium and there are also wild burros and cattle out there, which can mean guardia. We also had food and flashlights and matches and everything you would need to survive, as well as climbing gear for rappelling and any possible climbs. We wanted to be able to climb around any pour-overs if we couldn't get down them. We felt we were prepared for about everything when we had a climbing harness for Zadie, and of course, we both carried small inner tubes and a portable battery-operated pump to blow them up. These were in case we came to some big, deep tank. So, early morning, we were up, and off we went. The plan was to canyoneer our way down this somewhat obscure and unnamed little canyon that looked like it became a slot, and then came out at the bottom. We would then hike back up, around on top, to get back to the car. You can hike the slick rock and avoid the slot to get back. That was the plan. Zadie loved to go with us, and she's a good dog in every way. She minds pretty well, and she loves to swim, being a lab. She was barking her fool head off all the way, playing in the water in the little potholes along the way, and chasing the sticks cow would throw. Before long, the canyon narrowed into a delightful place, nice and shady, and we even found a few petroglyphs. We sat down and had an early lunch enchanted by the canyon, our real lives and worries far away. A pair of ravens floated down to check on us, and I threw them bits from my sandwich. But Zadie got them instead. She had her own gourmet doggy hiking bars, but she wanted our boring sandwiches. Typical Zadie. After a bit, we continued on and the canyon narrowed just as we suspected it would. Zadie led the way, her excitement contagious. We were having a great time, and it didn't look like anyone else had been here recently nary a track. The canyon quickly narrowed, and we were soon hiking along the sandy bottom of a slot canyon. There was debris a good 20 feet above our head, indicating the depth the flash floods got. It was spooky. We knew we weren't in any flood danger as the sky was clear as far as we could see, and spring is a good time to hike as you usually don't get afternoon thunder thunderstorms. But slots are a bit spooky, and sometimes I get a bit claustrophobic. This one was quickly narrowing, and soon we had to turn sideways to get through. We had considered that we might have to turn around and hike back up the canyon if it got too narrow. We just didn't know what it would do. The topography map indicated it stayed fairly passable, but maps can be a bit off depending on scale. Zadie led on, tail wagging. Now, the canyon was almost too tight to get through, and I was beginning to think we would have to turn back. Now, Zadie was whining, 
and we could see that she had gotten far enough ahead of us to where the canyon narrowed too much for passage. She was stuck and couldn't turn around and was panicking instead of walking backward out of it. Cal and I quickly ran to her as we didn't want her to go any further if she did manage to get unstuck, but we were too late. She popped on through the tight spot, and the next thing we knew, we heard a loud flash. Our beautiful day now quickly became a nightmare. Zadie had slipped through the tight spot and managed to fall off a pour-over into a tank from the sounds of it, and we had no way to get her to bring her back up. I felt panicked. Cal quickly assessed the situation, looking up the canyon walls to see if there were any we could climb up and over. But the canyon was a good 50 feet deep at this point. There was absolutely no way to scale the walls, and we just didn't have enough hardware to get us up there, even though we had a rope that long. I could hear Zadie swimming and splashing around, and it sounded like there was no place to get out, and it sounded like there was no place to get out of the water. Some of these tanks have steep sides and no place to push off to get out. We rescued her a couple of times on hikes when she would jump in and not be able to get out. She had learned to not just jump in unless she had permission, which is pretty good for a water dog. No big deal when you're there where you can just reach in, grab her collar, but now we couldn't get to her. And as cold as the water was, she would soon be hypothermic. I felt sick and had no idea what to do. I tried to squeeze through the slot as I'm smaller than Cal, but no way, and we didn't have a lot of time to help her. Now Zadie was whining in a most pitiful way, and I knew she was scared and getting cold and tired. How long could she keep swimming? Cal was trying to find a way up and over when suddenly Zadie's voice changed from a pitiful whine to a growl, then to the bark of a very frightened dog. Now she was yelping as if something were harming her, and I could just picture a cougar attacking her as the swell is home to a number of them. I started crying, thinking of what she was going through and how helpless we were. Then, all of a sudden, she was back with us. She looked shocked, and I'm sure we did too. Something had lifted her up and pushed her back through the slot. There was no way she could have jumped back through it. Sweet Mary, how did this happen? It was a miracle. Zadie was soaked and shivering, and I wrapped my jacket around her and held her to me, comforting both her and myself. Cal was at the slot, calling out, Who's there? Are you okay? Are you stuck? He got down on his knees and tried to see through the narrow space. There was no answer. Zadie was now settling down, but every time she would look at the slot, she would start shivering again. I watched her and knew this was from fear, not just from being cold. She was scared stiff of whatever had helped her get out. This was too weird, because whatever it was, it had to be human to lift her. It had to have hands. Just then, the most heart-wrenching moan came from below the slot. It made me feel like I was hearing the voice of something from long ago, from some kind of primal force that no longer existed, from some creature almost extinct that maybe the early Indians in this region had moved into cliff dwellings to hide from. Oh my god, Cal said, there's something stuck down there. I noted. He didn't say somebody. What can we do? I asked. All I know is to backtrack and see if we can get out of the canyon and up above. Maybe we can help that way. We started back up the canyon. I put Zadie on her leash. No way was I going to have any more worries. She didn't act like she was going anywhere anyway. She was totally deflated and still shaking. She was now pretty much dry. I deduced she was still scared to death. The way she carried her tail between her legs and kept trying to get me to carry her confirmed it. I haven't carried her since she was a pup. She's too big. We felt a sense of urgency. If something or someone was stuck down there, they also would be in the water, just like Zadie, and hypothermia is the number one killer of hikers and adventurers.
even in the desert. Before long, we could find a place where we could climb out and were soon above the canyon on the slick rock above. Picture a big kidney-shaped mountain, about 60 miles long and 30 wide, with deep canyon cutting through it, and you'll have the swell. We were now on the slick rock above the slot canyon, where we could walk alongside it and look down into it. We soon figured we were near the area where we'd been standing just before, the place where Zadie got stuck. We walked a bit further, and Cal then inched over to the edge on his belly, so he could see down into the depth. Our estimate was good. He was directly above what appeared to be a deep tank, right below a pour-over, about ten feet tall. That must be where Zadie slipped down into the water, landing with the splash we'd heard. Anybody down there? Cal yelled. We were a good fifty feet above the canyon bottom. He shined our flashlight up and down in the depth, but it was too far down and too dark. Now we heard the moaning again. We were directly above it. What else could we do? Cal took out our rope, tied one end to a nearby juniper tree, tied a foot crucifix onto the other end, then threw it down yelling, Put your foot into the end and we'll pull you up. There was no response. He looked down and could see the end of the rope dangling about 15 feet above the tank. It was almost long enough, but not quite. Okay, I said out loud, talking mostly to myself, there has to be a bit of a lip above the tank, as it took a moment before we heard Zadie fly down into the water. If we can get back down into the canyon and get the rope down th through that slot, whoever is down there can climb it back up to that lip and at least get out of the cold water. The rope might reach them if we can get them back up here and drop it back down. We all ran back along the canyon, dropping back into it and rushing down to the slot. Cal took the rope and tossed it through the slot, but it didn't seem to go anywhere. He started yelling again. Are you still there? Are you okay? We're trying to get a rope down to you. Answer if you're okay. No sound. But then we heard splashing, and I knew whatever it was was still alive and in there. We had to help it. It had saved Zadie. Now we had to return the favor. There has to be a way, I said out loud, thinking again, but unable to come up with anything. Then suddenly I knew. I found a long stick that had been carried down in the flash flood debris, a stick about twelve feet long. I tied one end of the rope to the stick, then pushed the stick through the slot. My hunch was right. The slot wasn't that long, and we could hear the stick fall into the tank below. Would whoever or whatever see what we were trying to do and climb out? Was there even a big enough space above the tank to stand on? Oh, belay! Cal cried, having wrapped the rope around his waist, hoping the person below would start climbing. Holy crap, he immediately called out. Susie, hurry, quick, I'm losing it. He began wrapping it around a rock. I grabbed the rope and held on for dear life. Whoever it was, was very heavy, but we managed to keep the rope from slipping until it went flat. I knew they were now standing on the other side of the narrow slot. Now what? Now we heard a new sound, a low hump, and it was very close. Zadie's hackles stood up, but she didn't growl. Now we would run back up above and figure out how to get them out. At least now they weren't in the water, and maybe now the rope would reach. Cal tugged on the rope until it was released and he could pull it back up through the slot. We'll be back, he yelled. Don't go away. We jumped back out of the canyon and were soon above the tank again. Now Cal tied one end of the rope to a big juniper tree. He tied Zadie's harness to the other end, presumably to give the person something to hold on to as we pulled them out. He then tossed it over the edge. Oh, belay, he called. There was no response. Had the rope gone where we wanted, he crawled again to the edge to peer over, and yes, we were right above the tank. He pulled the rope up and tossed it again. Maybe they hadn't been able to reach it. This time, it was immediately taut. Cal started trying to pull the rope up, 
but it didn't budge. Was it stuck? He looked over the edge again, but this time he quickly jumped up. Get away, he yelled at me, grabbing me by the arm and pulling me and Zadie away from the rope. I thought maybe it was tangling or something. I had no idea what was going on. He kept pulling me away, and we were soon a good fifty feet from the edge, standing behind a big juniper. Just then, what emerged from the canyon made me rub my eyes in disbelief. A thin creature stood there, covered head to toe in white hair, except around its eyes and mouth where the skin was dark. It was at least seven feet tall and reminded me of a cross between a gorilla and a human, the body being gorilla-like and the face being human. Zadie whimpered and had her hackles up and tried again to get me to hold her. I sank to the ground in disbelief and shock. Cal just stood there. The creature climbed up the rope. It stood there in the bright sunlight for a moment, as if in disbelief, looking at us with big eyes. There was no white in its eyes. I remember that. It was soaked and shivering. It looked like it would collapse, but it slowly turned and walked away down the face of the swell. I wondered how it had ended up in a deep tank in a slot canyon in the swell, though I've since heard of other Bigfoot encounters in the upper forest of that region, over near Richfield. Maybe it had simply slipped and fallen in, trying to get a drink, coming up from below. After it had walked away, it stopped and turned back. I'll never forget what it then did. It spoke to us, saying something in a voice that carried like thunder, but that was gentle and subdued, and even a little bit sad. I don't know what the word meant, but I do know what the meaning was. It was thanking us. Cal saluted it. It turned and left, and we never saw it again. On to the next one. A nine-year-old Tom Driscoll of Tuckerton in Ocean County in New Jersey was traveling with his father along Western Avenue near a swampy area. Suddenly, they heard something dashing through the woods and a hideous sound like someone tearing a woman apart. Other people heard the sound, too, and found unusual footprints in the area. An attempt was made to track the creature with dogs. The creature sounded as if it was traveling very fast through the wet, swampy terrain. On to the next one. In the New Grenta area in Burlington County, a boy named Jack Wiseman and his uncle, John and Fred, took him fishing down to Dove's Point, where they caught a lot of perch. It was getting late, and they left the meadow, and by the time they started through the wood on Phillips Road, it was getting dark. In those days, it was a mile-long road running through a dense wooded area. As they walked down the road, they heard this terrible scream, which began to get closer as they walked. Uncle John told Uncle Fred to grab the boy's hand and run for it. Uncle Jack stayed behind with the fish and would throw a fish every now and again as they moved forward. They ran out of fish two-thirds of the way down the road, and at this time both uncles grabbed Jack's arms and practically carried him to Uncle Merrill's house. They could hear the noise of the creature crashing through the undergrowth until it got to Stony Swamp and then it stopped. Both Aunt Ida and Uncle Merrill were listening to it when they got to the house. When Uncle Merrill went out to the barn at 4 a.m. the following morning to feed and milk the cows, they were not in the barn. They were all in the upper pasture. As he entered the barn to get the cows, the creature made a loud screech and knocked him down, spilling the contents of the bucket. Uncle Merrill describes it as a big brown thing with a large head. The cows would not return to the barn until daybreak. Around this same time, a relative named John Mathis was sitting on his porch rocker one moonlit night when something light brown and about six feet tall dashed around the corner of his house. 
It ran through the tomato patch, tearing up some plants before disappearing into the wood. On to the next one. In Salem County in New Jersey, a Bigfoot shook a taxi car while the driver tried to change the tire. The driver had just finished changing the tire when he felt the car begin to shake. Looking up, the witness saw a creature that stood upright like a man, without clothing and covered with hair. The taxi driver drove to Salem so fast he left his jack and old tire behind. Two men drove back from Salem to investigate and found only the tire and the jack. On to the next one. A number of people in Renaco Wood in Burlington County encountered a black hairy creature with a bad smell. After this, other people roamed the woods along Renasco's Creek with guns. Two young brothers decided to take up the search and each climbed a tree on opposite sides of a path and had not been there very long when a foul-smelling creature dashed by them, giving them a terrible scare. A few weeks later, a large hog was killed in the area, but one of the brothers insisted that it was not a large hog that had scared them. On to the next one. An 11 year old girl in Medford in Burlington County looked out of her bedroom window and was astonished to see a monster staring in at her. She described it as being manlike but not manlike, with a human form, but it wasn't human. She believed it had been looking in on her for some time, and when she screamed for her mother, it disappeared into the night. On to the next one. There were several sightings of a monster in Gibbstown in Greenwich Township in Gloucester County. A group of boys were at the DuPont Clubhouse when a 10-year-old boy saw a creature looking into the window and was so shocked that he screamed and went into convulsions. The next night, another boy experienced the same thing. Around the same time, People heard unearthly screams like wild birds in the area. Several people went in search of the creature, and one of them, Ronald James, claimed it grabbed him in the woods. Jerry Ray was combing the area that same night with a group of boys when he claimed it almost grabbed him and had a wild look in its eyes. There were reports that it was half man and half beast. Others stated it was seven feet tall with an ugly face. On to the next one. Near Chatsworth in Burlington County in New Jersey. This was a Girl Scout camping trip to what is now the Brenner T. Brine State Forest. Back then, it was called the Lebanon State Forest. This is in the north region of the New Jersey Pine Barren. We were a scout troop of about 20 girls ages 8 to 10 and 3 camp counselors. The camp counselors had prepared a huge pot of spaghetti and meatballs for our dinner the first night there. To get to this campsite, you drove into the remote area on a one-car-wide sand road. The sand was very soft, and cars would get stuck regularly in the sand. Then you parked when that road ended and hiked through the forest to a lake. I believe it was called Cedar Lake. We were to set up a campsite on the bank of the lake, this was in the month of June, I believe, so it was hot and very dry. A clear night and moonshine everywhere after it got dark. Well, it wasn't long after we made a campfire and started unpacking our gear that the counselor came around very upset, saying that the huge pot of spaghetti and meatballs was missing. No one had any idea where it was. She had placed it with other gear near the fire and it just disappeared. So, no dinner that night. She had us all come around the fire so she could keep an eye on us do head count. Then it started. The thrashing of the bushes just past the campsite in the woods around us. It circled around and around. Then there was tree knocking over and over again. 
then loud whistling, which was not a bird, but something with a large lung capacity, creating one long, eerie sound. They were first on one side of the campsite, then on the other, like they were communicating with each other. The counselors decided we were all to stay right near the fire, where they could do head count. Everyone was afraid. We were told to stay in our sleeping bags all around the fire and not move or leave our sleeping bags. Across the lake, there was a Boy Scout troop camp at the same time. The counselors called across the lake, not a big lake, for them to come across the lake to help us. The Boy Scouts and the counselors did and sat with us at the fire and listened to the continuing knocking sounds and whistling and thrashing. It was not a prank. The Boy Scouts were afraid, just like we were, and decided we weren't to leave until daybreak because it would be too dangerous to hike back through the woods to the cars. There were no cell phones back then, so everyone had to wait until we could run through the woods to the cars and get to a phone to report this. The Boy Scout counselor did that, and state police were arriving as we drove away and out of the park at about 5.30 a.m. My mother told me first that I was never going camping again, and second, that the police told the Girl Scout counselor that they found nothing anywhere around the campsite or in the woods. The spaghetti was never found. Back then, you would attribute such things happening to the Jersey Devil, but in this case, I would have to say, after all the information today, that it was a Bigfoot or a couple of Bigfoot who just did not want us there. It also made no sense to think it was a human or human who wanted us out of there. If a human had stolen the food, he would have gone far away so not to be caught, certainly not scare us so bad all night long, so that we would call the police. All around Chatsworth, New Jersey, were cranberry and blueberry farms as well as pig farms. It would seem to me that if I was a Bigfoot, that would have been an ideal area to live. There were many witnesses, including 20 Girl Scouts, several Boy Scouts, and about six Scout Counselors, three Boy Scout Counselors, and three Girl Scout Counselors. It was after nightfall, about 11 p.m., clear and dark with some moonshine. The area was scrub pine forest with swamp called Theater Swamp and Lake. I believe the lake was called Theater Lake. This entire area is all sand, with the scrub pines and the cedar trees. The lake is a dark brown from the resin of the cedar trees. I heard many stories of the pig farmers and the dairy farmers all around there finding their livestock killed and half-eaten or necks broken or just dragged away and disappeared. Their incidents were legendary in South Jersey at the time. I do not believe there are any more dairy farmers in that area, but this was reported over and over again. My father owned two blueberry farms near Medford Lake, New Jersey, so we were in contact with the local farmers and knew what was going on. On to the next one. J.W. Burns had originally coined the term Sasquatch. He was a school teacher during the 1920s who gathered different descriptions, adding to the profile and identity of what seemed to be the same thing described by many various Native American tribes in southwestern B.C., Canada. These tribes lived in different areas spread throughout a broad range of British Columbia with many different spoken languages. Some of the different names which Burns had probably heard from different area tribes are Sasiva, Siatko, Tisatko, Siatka, Sital, Sasquek, Soquetel, Soskatel, Saskut, Sasquat, Sasket, Saskahavis, among others. Regardless of different names, this creature fit the apparent description of many details along various Native American tribes. Apparently, calling this creature by one name Sasquatch which was somewhat similar to all of the other names combined. Kind of made sense. This is where we get and came up with the name Sasquatch. J.W. Burns also wrote many articles 
relative to the stories on the true existence of the North American Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Many of these articles were based on first-hand Native American accounts or stories, and were first published in BC newspapers. The stories gained even more attention and were then published throughout various magazines, including Wide World and Maclean's. According to Martin T. Place in her 1974 book On the Track of Bigfoot, J.W. Burns wrote an article in the April 1, 1929 issue of McLean's magazine titled Introducing B.C.'s Hairy Giant. The article retold of an early Native American woman's account of having been kidnapped by a male, Sami Sokwiam, a tribal name meaning wild man of the woods. According to the woman, this was while she was at the upper end of Harrison Lake in B.C., Canada back when she was a young lady. Another article, Burns wrote, involved a successful logger who went exploring for what the Native American loggers had referred to as Sasquatal, while enjoying some of his free time on Vancouver Island. Not a bad place to explore, or is it? He had insisted upon proving the First Nation's fear as invalid, single-handedly, mind you. Yet, he came across the creature while it was in the process of washing roots and stacking them alongside a creek. This was in an area where the tribal lockers had refused to go. According to Professor Lauren Coleman in his 2003 Bigfoot Sasquatch History Book, Bigfoot, The True Stories of Apes in America, J.W. Burns wrote an article about an event known as Indian Sasquatch Days, which was held at Harrison Hot Springs in British Columbia, Canada. As Burns writes in the article, a very prominent official of the British Columbia government made a bad slip. He goes on to explain that in the article how this gentleman had offended the First Nation who were present by exclaiming over a radio microphone that Sasquatch was not real and that, in fact, no one had ever seen one of them. This remark had apparently upset a rather large majority of the Native Americans who were present at this event. The rustling of buckskin garment and the tinkling of ornamental bells was a response to the gesture, as more than 2,000 First Nations rose to their feet in angry protest. Chief Flying Eagle, who was also among those who were present, went right past the dignitaries and important others who were in this group and turned to the microphone while on stage. He addressed all those who were present by exclaiming over the radio in a bold voice, The white speaker is wrong. To all who now hear, I say, Some white men have seen Sasquatch. Many Indians have seen them and spoken to them. Sasquatch are still all around here. I've spoken. It would seem to make more sense if this is a real animal, that this rather large group of First Nations would take such offense to a comment about Sasquatch not being real. After all, isn't this a creature that supposedly kidnaps and is also described to kill people, in which is oftentimes referred to as a cannibal, a giant, or a devil? in many of the different Native American Indian legends and stories, then it makes sense that these First Nations were very much offended by a statement about an animal which may have been kidnapped or even killed certain tribal members, many of which may not have been present to speak of the last thing which they had encountered. The Casca the Casca live inland from the Pacific coast between northern BC and the southern part of the Yukon in Canada. From a 1917 edition of the Journal of American Folklore, in a section of periodical stories written by James A. Teat, titled Casca Tales, the additional details of what is referred to as a giant, the big man, the Atik, and the monster. 
from among the Casca tribe. One of these stories relates of a giant who is fooled quite easily from human contact, which is initiated as a survival defense by a human being who feels threatened while in the creature's presence. As quoted from the article, giants are so foolish and easily fooled. Human contact being initiated as a defense while in the presence of Bigfoot appears to be a common theme or suggestion in many Native American stories. Some stories make the suggestion of people being able to make an escape as long as the creature is treated as partially human, such as speaking to it as a defense in order to stall for time or to make an escape. These stories also suggest what this animal would probably be like. According to what the article suggests, there are also tales of white stealing giants from among the Kafka. Among the texts written by James A. Teat, there is also the suggestion that Bigfoot Sasquatch may use black bears and grizzly bears as pack animals. The creature is also said to make a noise similar to a baby crying like cougars or mountain lions as a way to fool people as one of the tales describes. There is a story mentioned in one of the articles which involves a man and his wife who are traveling among various lakes and streams while trying to trap and catch many beaver. As they are traveling between water sources, the wife notices the giant monster trailing them. Yet, the husband would not believe her. Her husband would not believe that she had seen this animal. This is still a much similar reaction among skeptics nowadays. However, it's still a much healthier reaction to be a skeptic than a believer in things which don't always point toward the facts. As the husband becomes aware of the monster that has been tracking, stalking, and eventually chasing he and his wife, they travel across the top of an icy lake to a village of people who are on the other side. When the monster tries to follow the couple across the top of the icy lake, his weight causes him to go crashing through the ice upon the first footstep. As the story then relates, the monster had no trouble in making it across to the other side of the lake, apparently having traveled under the ice, where he then arose and broke out of the ice head first onto the beach filled with people. As the monster approaches the village, the only one who could stop and kill it was an outcast young shaman boy who had powers which he had not yet used. Tanatko is yet another name used among the Kafka in reference to the same described creature. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye! I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!